I'm using for a subject this evening, sharing our life in Christ in service. The text comes from our Lord's Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter, and I'll begin reading with verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law, and how readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. I want to lay emphasis on the latter portion of the 28th verse. He answered and said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. You know what to say? Now go do it. You've preached, now go practice what you've preached. Isn't it strange that everybody wants to live, but he spends his time dying? You will agree, I'm sure, that we live in a sadly sick society. One day, an expert in Moses' law came to test Jesus' orthodoxy by asking him this question. Teacher, what does a man need to do to live now and to live forever in heaven. And Jesus replied, what does Moses' law say about it? And the man replied, Moses' law said, thou must love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and then you must love your neighbor just as you love yourself. Jesus said, that's right. Go do it, and you shall live. You know what to say? Go do it. We not only must say what's right, but we must do what's right. If you really want to live, you must share your life in Christ in service. Now we are meeting against the backdrop of mounting world tension. This hate-filled world is desperate for a decent way of life. Now I'm too ignorant to speak wisely, and I trust I'm too wise to speak ignorantly. But a man does not have to be listed in the who's who to know what's what day. As he stands with a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in the other with his eyes focused on the television and his ears tuned to the radio, he can hear of wars and rumors of wars rumbling around the world. If you really want to live, you've got to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him give you Life that will never end. And then go and share that life that you have with others. You know, the trouble with us in our day is we are trying to love each other. We are trying to get along with each other without God. In the last decade or so, we have spent millions trying to get men to live peaceably one with the other. Now, you will know that men... Quit acting like brothers in Cain and Abel's day. We say we have a racial problem, our problem is racial, but I submit to you that our problem is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. Cain and Abel were the sons of the same father and mother, and thereby of the same race, and Cain killed Abel. And then, if you think that it's just a skin problem, if you're going down a dark stretch of the road at night and you hear some footsteps behind you, you don't wonder what color that man is. You want to know the condition of his heart. We must love God and then neighbor in that order. I said we're trying to pay men to live peaceably one with the other. Don't you know God is the only one who has to love, who loves without a reason. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
but human beings love for reason. I hear the psalmist saying, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Because. But God loves us without our being lovable or lovely. God loves us not because Jesus died for us, but Jesus died for us because God loves us. And if you want your life serviceable in the kingdom of our Lord, you've got to start at Abraham's tent and get you some faith. You've got to visit Moses at Midian and get you some preparation. You've got to go up on the mountain where Elijah is and get you some fire. You've got to go to Job's house and get you some patience. You've got to go to Paul's dungeon and get you some determination and missionary zeal. You've got to plow through the word of God and stop on the Jericho road long enough for the good Samaritan to teach you how to love your neighbor. And then you've got to go to Calvary and get you some love and go down in the empty tomb and get you some eternal life and go somewhere in your secret closet and mix it all up in prayer. You'll be serviceable in the kingdom of our Lord. That's the reason Paul said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ is the supreme pattern for Christian living. You copy others and you copy their faults. You copy Christ and there's no fault to copy. Not only does he set before us the perfect structure of his own flawless career, but he furnishes every one of us who desires it a blueprint for our own lives. But to build after his model, you must have his mind. And what kind of a mind does he have? He has a mind devoted to God and the good. He has a mind of high aspiration and humble service. He has a mind of faith and faithfulness. You know, we ought to love God and neighbor. We must worship God and witness to every creature. You know, some want to select the people to whom they witness. And the commission is to every creature. We want to, we, we want to find somebody who looks like we want him to look and sound like we want him to sound. But it's to every creature. We must love God. We must worship God. And then we must witness to every creature. We are to witness not only by lip, but we must witness by life. We must not only have a Christian vocabulary, but we must have Christian experience. You know, some people think that the Christian religion is just uh, something that you talk about. And they think that they can talk their religion. You know, if we were to stop here now and just let everybody talk. We used to have, call it having a testifying meeting. And my grandmother called it a test line meeting. But if you let everybody talk, in the next, in the next five minutes there would be a lot of weeping and crying, I'm a Christian. You may not know it, but I'm a Christian. Let me tell you, child, if you're a Christian, somebody else is going to know it. By their fruits, ye shall know them. Faith is your invitation to let God use you on his own terms. Now, just, just for a moment, think what would happen right here tonight if everybody here would just allow the Lord to have his way in your life. Why, a revival would break out right here. You know, we all try to pray, Lord, send us a revival. We need revival. Lord, and he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you won't have to worry. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. So the next move is ours. God's ready. Are you ready? Men want to be saved, but they want to be saved on their own terms. If you'll allow God to use you on his own terms, you'll not only see what God can do for you, but you'll see what he can do with you and through you. Faith is the link that binds our nothingness to almightiness. Faith is human weakness laying hold on divine strength. Now, if a thing is possible, 
It can be done by skill and experience. But if a thing is impossible, it can be done only by faith. Now faith is not going to stop the storm, but I'll tell you what it'll do. It'll help you to stand it. This old world is tattered and torn, and faith will take the tangled threads of men's hopes and knit them in the tapestries of fadeless glory. Faith will help you to face life's music when you don't even like the tune. The venture of faith gives reality to our hopes. It'll cause you to live on invisible means of support. You can eat well in the wilderness and sing the doxology in a dungeon. Faith is essential, but faith is not enough by itself. That's just the starting point. Our Lord gave a demonstration of faith and works. It was on the occasion of the Feast of the Tabernacle. A blind man was sitting by the wayside begging. Now other men became blind, but this man was born like that. This man had never seen the face of his loved ones. He'd never seen a sunrise or a sunset. This man had never seen color blushing a rose. This man had felt raindrops, but he'd never seen clouds floating overhead. This man had heard thunder, but he'd never seen lightning flash. This man is in a pitiful condition, sitting there, blind, begging. But the disciples were interested only to a point. They were only interested in the cause. They were not interested in a cure. They just wanted to have something to talk about. They just wanted to have it said when they got in their rap session that we know what caused this blindness. They were only, only interested in theology. And they called themselves asking a deep theological question. Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? But Jesus turned their theology into doxology, for he said, Neither, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Now Jesus is not saying that the man has never sinned or that the parents had not sinned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what Jesus is saying, that no one's sin caused this blindness. I can hear Jesus saying, I had him born like that for just such time as this. I had him born like that so that when men run low on faith, I had him born like that so that when men think that faith is all they need, I had him born like that, that I might glorify God. And he set out to give this demonstration, and he's going to do it in slow motion. Now Jesus could have just willed, and the man's eyes would have come open. But he takes his time. He's going to demonstrate the importance of faith and works. He takes his time. He spit on the ground. He mixes the spit and the clay. And then he takes his time and smooths it on the man's eyes. And tells him to go and wash in the pool. This man first of all had to have faith in Jesus. If he'd had no faith, this blind man would have resented. He would have protested. He would have said, why this man is mocking me. I'm, I've been blind all my life and... Uh, here he is putting mud and spit on my eyes. But there was something in Jesus' voice that caused the man to want to try. And he started out just like he was. I said faith is a starting point. That's a good starting point. That's the only starting point. This man got up and went straight to the pool. Now he possibly didn't have a C&I dog. He possibly didn't have... Or know anything about radar, but he went straight to the pool. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I'm weak, but thou art mighty, hold me with thy powerful hand. You know, if you will go in the faith that the Lord gives you, if you will use that little, he'll increase it while you're in the journey. 
And then when you come to the end of the journey, you can testify that the journey has been joyful. You know, when you get in your car and start out for home tonight, you may not have enough light to shine all the way home. But as your vehicle moves, the light moves. When you turn right, the light turns right. When you turn left, the light turns left. When you go up the hill, the light's up the hill. When you get in the valley, the light's in the valley. And after a while, you've got light all the way home. Use the faith that the Lord gives you and he will increase it. Yes, he will. He'll, he'll strengthen you as you obey. This man went on to the pool. And when he got there, he didn't just stand and shout about his faith. This man had to work. This man washed. And when he washed, when he worked, when he coupled his faith and his work, his eyes came open. And now he's got something to shout about. Now he can tell others what good things the Lord has done for us. I once was blind, but now I see. Oh, I used to murmur and complain and argue with life. But when I found Jesus precious to my soul, I moved off of Complaint Avenue and am now living on Thanksgiving Boulevard. Praise the Lord. This man has something to shout about now. He has faith and works. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work until the close of the day, I shall see the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I'll rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. I have faith in him, yes. But I put my faith to work. And I'm going to work until the day is over. Jesus said, occupy until I come. You know, many people, instead of occupying until he comes, they are occupied with his coming. They're trying to pinpoint the time of his coming. But he's always sitting around trying to figure out just when he's coming. Now, I know he's coming. And I can't say soon. I don't know when. But he's coming. They're trying to pinpoint the time of his coming. And every once in a while, somebody will... Uh, make an announcement that I know that he's coming on such and such a day. A few years ago, somebody made an announcement that Christ would return on a March the 16th. People got all excited and they began to call and say, Pastor, what do you think about that announcement that Christ is going to return on a March the 16th? I said, I don't think a thing about it. And if it disturbs you, you go out to the nearest cemetery, and when you see the tombstone still standing upright, don't worry. For when he comes, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. When he comes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the other prophets, are going to rise and run the streets, and everybody they see, they're going to say, I told you so. When he comes... Abraham's going to nudge Sarah and say, wake up, Sarah, the Lord's here. When he comes, David's going to ask for his harp and play once more, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We need to work now. While it's day, for when the night cometh, no man can work. We need to work until he comes. You remember when Jesus got ready to confirm his divine mission in the minds of men, he carried Peter, James, and John up on the mountain of transfiguration. He brought Moses and Elijah down to represent heaven. And there on that mountain, in that conference, there was just one item on the agenda. Jesus talked about dying. He talked about dying until his countenance changed. He talked about dying until Peter got happy and said, let's build three tabernacles. He talked about dying. And I believe, I believe that he appointed Moses to lead that crowd who has died in the Lord. And I believe that he appointed Elijah to lead that crowd who will be still alive when he comes. You know, Elijah didn't die. He just caught a fiery chariot and went on home. And I believe, I believe 
that while we are getting ready, I believe that we're going to sing a double anthem. I'm glad that those who will be still alive will not go off and leave those in the grave. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We're going to sing this double anthem. Elijah's crowd's going to sing, O death, where is thy sting? And Moses' crowd's going to sing, O grave, where is thy victory? And then we're going to all join in the chorus and sing, Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be caught up together to meet him in the air. Somebody said, we'll walk in Jerusalem just like John, but the Bible says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Somebody says, we'll get on board an old ship of Zion. She has landed a many a thousand. She has landed my old father. She has landed my old mother. But the book says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. And then somebody says we are climbing Jacob's ladder. And every round goes higher and higher. But the Bible says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Now it used to be a song. Don't hear it so much now. Lord, I want two wings to veil my face. I want two wings to fly away. And then the head of stanza that says, Lord, meet me. Meet me in the middle of the air. And if these wings should fail me, meet me with another pair. There's no failure in him. Why, the reservoir of his resources never recedes. Whatever Lord gives you, it won't fail you. I know he has given me salvation, and that's not going to fail me. Oh, I'm saved. I'm talking about right now. I'm saved now. I don't have to wait till I come to die. No, I'm saved now. You know, I get excited about it. When I get to thinking about the Lord has saved me, has given me life that will never end. And somebody right there said, well, preacher, when you come to die, no. I'll just come I'll just come down to the line that separates time and eternity and I'll just step across that line. While I'm over here, I'm asking the Lord to be with me. But when I step across that line, I'll be there where He is. And then the blessed part about it, there we shall ever be with the Lord. Praise His name. We shall ever be with the Lord. And do you ever think about what it's going to be like to be with the Lord? There we shall ever be be with the Lord. You know, some people say, I just like to sit quiet and, 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 and listen. Oh, when we get where the Lord is, don't expect it to be quiet there. There's going to be shouting. Oh, you know, in seminary they taught me how to stand in one track and hold my Bible. They taught me how to gesture to emphasize certain points. They taught me how to regulate and modulate my voice so it won't be so loud and obnoxious. And you know, I passed the course. But when I get to thinking about being with the Lord, I get excited about it. I can't help but shout. You say, why are they hollering? Why are they yelling? Look, you haven't you haven't seen any shouting yet. You just wait until my feet strike Zion. You just wait until I behold his face. Oh, you just wait until I hear him say, Seven, well done. You just wait. There we shall ever be with the Lord. Will you be there? Don't fool me. Will you be there? I'll be there when the saints go marching in. Will you be there? I'll be there when the four and twenty elders bow around the altar. Will you be there? I'll be there when they crown him Lord of all. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are thankful for your word that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Our Father, we are thankful for the privilege that we have together here in worship and in fellowship and in praise and in prayer. Oh God, may each person here 
think on his and her way. Our Father, those here who have not accepted you as Savior, we pray that they will do it now. Those who will not acknowledge you as Lord, let them know that you are not going to be their Savior or Lord, but you're going to be Savior and Lord. And our Father, help them to turn, help them to come to thee, help them to look to you and live. And our Father, some have gotten weak on the way. We pray that you will renew our strength. We pray that you will allow your flame and love to defrost our frigid devotion so we'll be less of what we have been and more of what you would have us be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.